Lectures listeners, welcome back to this Fox Page lecture on Joan Didion's incredible and important The White Album. We are going to continue our discussion today of the essay, The White Album, uh, not to be confused with the collection in its entirety. I knew this was going to happen. I had grand desires. I mean, in the, in the beginning, I was thinking, oh, we can talk about this essay and that essay, and I can, you know, discuss the echoes of such and such and such and such. And I was like, you know what? No, we're, I don't even think we're going to get through one in the 90 minutes, which is, you know, in some ways, I feel like we're really doing Joan justice here. I also, in fact, think that this is a, it's a very sort of, um, in lots of ways, I think it's a very like good approach to this collection in particular because of that idea that that this one um, this one essay, in fact, it, it really is a good encapsulation. It's a very good um, indication and kind of uh, uh, you know it, it's like an object um, that we can look to as indicative of the entire collection itself. Okay, so we talked before about how one of the many strengths of uh, of Didion's prose is that she makes it so relatable. So, you know, she's putting together the idea of cooking for lots of people, which we can appreciate, together with this idea of, you know, making motion pictures and writing for magazines. But more importantly, she really leans into this idea of herself as as flawed and as a vulnerable person. And she's, she's right up front about all of her uh, her difficulties, marital, um, you know, in terms of being a mother, in terms of just literally psychologically operating in the world. So that kind of vulnerability makes us feel like we can uh, trust her. And, and, and on some level, it, 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 it provides an intimacy that, that makes us care and that makes us really sort of want to hear what she has to say. Um, but so we're going to dive down a little bit more deeply into some of the kind of the, the things that make the prose as unique as it is. So one of the things that I've touched on, but we haven't really dived into, are these ideas of these echoes and these repetitions and this refrain. So we're going to look at page 18 and 19. Um, so this is the it's this is a very good example of this. I mean, you can see those of you on the um, the YouTube channel, you can see like my marginalia there and all of my circling and whatnot. On page 18 at the bottom, she has um, verbatim in uh, in italics and sort of indented a block indentation here of the uh, the sort of sampler that is on her mother-in-law's uh, wall, and the last lines are, "And bless the crystal window pane that lets the starlight in, and bless each door that opens wide to stranger as to kin." So. You know, you have a sense that this is not a life that uh, that Joan Didion necessarily shares. This is not, you know, she's not someone who has samplers. On, although actually, that is not true. She does, in fact, have a sampler on her wall. I know this from her other one of her other collections. It is a, a like a, an actual sampler um, made by her great 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 grandmother or whichever great um, who came across in the Donner Party. But she is not someone who would have something, I think, quite this kind of twee and optimistic and warm and welcoming on her wall. I think she's far too cynical for that. But what's beautiful is that in that very next paragraph, she does this kind of reversal thing that she does. But more importantly, we have this echo. It's a verbatim echo of this quotation that she made of her mother-in-law. She says, in my neighborhood in California, we did not bless the door that opened wide to stranger as to kin. So what I think is um, genius here, I mean, there's a lot genius, but one thing that is so powerful is the way that she quotes so much of that. So instead of just saying we didn't open our doors to strangers, which I think a lesser writer would have been, um, it, it's important to me that we did not bless the door that opened wide to stranger as to kin. So you have this kind of musicality in her prose all throughout this collection where there's a sense of um, of echoing and this sense of refrain that is an attempt at order. It's an, an attempt to, to, to sort of um, understand things and to sort of comprehend them. I think often it ends up being um, like sort of highlighting the, the fact that narratives don't work. I mean, and in this case, it's a direct reversal of what has come right before. But so we have that one kind of nice, uh, like, uh, you know, refrain that's happening. And then it kind of braids into this long series of repetitions. It's not long, but this whole series of repeated words that, that are just really powerful um, on page 19 here. 
Paul and Tommy Scott Ferguson were the strangers at Roman Navarro's door up on Laurel Canyon. He was the one, those are the two men that went in and murdered him for no reason. Charles Manson was the, was the stranger at Rosemary and Lino LaBianca's door over in Los Feliz. So I think people in LA say Los Feliz, which to my Spanish speaking ear sounds very strange. Um, by the way, the, the, the second murder is the, the, um, the Rosemary and Lino La Bianca. They were people, um, who it, it's so eerie. So the first, the Manson family, the first murders of Sharon Tate, um, pregnant Sharon Tate were on Cielo Drive, which means heaven. And then, um, over at, um, at, uh, the La Bianca's house, La Bianca meaning the white something or other, um, the white over at the White's house over um, in Los Feliz, so Los Feliz or Los Feliz, um, meaning the happy ones. Um, it, it, to me, that just added, and, and these are the sort of details that, that uh, Didion is repeating over and over, this idea of heaven and this idea of happiness um, in, it, it's on Cielo Drive and in Los Feliz. Um, th there, there's a real sort of irony and a, and, a, and a sort of tragedy that's inherent in that. I'm, I'm gonna go back a little so you can get the full sense of this repetition. Paul and Tommy Scott Ferguson were the strangers at Ramon Navarro's door up on Laurel Canyon. Charles Manson was the stranger at Rosemary and Lino La Bianca's door over in Los Feliz. Some strangers at the door knocked and invented a reason to come inside. A call, say, to the triple A about a car not in evidence. Others just opened the door and walked in. I get this slippage. So, so far we're following these kinds of, you know, these serial murderers. And, and when she says, you know, some strangers, then you get a sense that she's talking about other stories she's heard. But then there's this slippage is just, it, it's like, I can't even explain it. It's like when you think you're reading one thing and then you realize in fact that what you're reading is something else. So she says, some strangers at the door knocked and invented a reason to come in. Others just opened the door and walked in and I would come across them in the entrance hall. So suddenly she is inserting herself again in this kind of bridge-like fashion into the horror of having, um, you know, a stranger at a time when, when there were serial murders happening in California and being widely, you know, televised and widely, uh, uh, you know, um, media. What, how would I, how, how do you, how do you say that? Loud, you know, they, they were in the media. So we have, um, and also the sense of place is the sense of California is so strong here, just mentions of Laurel Canyon or Los Feliz, um, you know, or Hollywood, any one of these things. Um, I would come across them in the entrance hall. I recall asking one such stranger. So again, we had the word stranger now has been repeated five times in the same paragraph. I recall asking one such stranger what he wanted. We looked at each other for what seemed a long time. And then he saw my husband on the stair landing. Chicken delight, he said finally, but we had ordered no chicken delight, nor was he carrying any. Again, this idea of chicken delight, I think, you know, there's a, there's a large irony there, this idea of being chicken, you know, being scared of something and the idea of delight. Of course, he's talking about some sort of um, Chinese takeout. But then again, the mastery for me is that she repeats that. So you don't have just the one chicken delight, she, it says here, but we had ordered no chicken delight, nor was he carrying any. The other thing here too, lots of Jones, um, lots of Didion's uh, uh, grammar is, is sort of conspicuously proper. So this idea of, you know, uh, we had ordered no chicken delight. It wasn't, we hadn't ordered chicken delight. They're not, con they, she doesn't use as many contractions and it tends to be a bit more elevated, very spare, but very correct and elevated. Um, nor was he carrying any. So this kind of order that she is imposing with the grammar is 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 very much um, throwing into relief the chaos of what's happening around. Then she continues. I took the license number of his panel truck. It seemed to me now that during those years, I was always writing down the license numbers of panel trucks. Panel trucks circling the block, panel trucks parked across the street, panel trucks idling at the intersection, I put these license numbers in a dressing table drawer where they could be found by the police when the time came. So this idea of the panel truck, um, I looked it up and all the pictures of it, I wondered, I just didn't know. Um, they, they look just like Ford, like a pickup. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure what a panel truck meant, but it, it, I think it was just sort of a truck and a lot of them had like a topper. I don't know, like a camper top kind of a thing. Um, or a panel truck sometimes um, 
was like a, at least the photos I saw, it's more like a delivery truck. But this repetition, I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six mentions of panel truck in a very short span, this repetition of this creepy threat. I mean, I think from my childhood, it would have been like the white van, you know, or windowless van. Um, th this idea of this threatening presence, th the repetition in the paragraph is really effective in terms of underscoring for the reader this threat. There's also something, I think you can hear it when I was reading it aloud, the panel truck, panel truck, panel truck. It sounds like panic. There's a sense of panicking um, th that is that is just palpable. So again, this kind of um, repetition in lots of ways feels very musical um, in a way that I think is really compelling. Okay, um, and then I want to talk next about uh, another element of her uh, her very effective prose is this idea of how sort of cool and distant she is. She seems very kind of objective and very uh, almost kind of a flat affect when it comes to things that are really kind of gruesome and terrible. So if we look at page 13, um, this is, I uh, alluded to this a little bit ago, but uh, so this is, I mean, this is actually kind of difficult to listen to. So uh, if you are potentially new to your mom and uh, you're feeling particularly vulnerable, I don't know. I think you can handle it. I think you can handle it. But also maybe you want to skip forward like 30 seconds. Okay. This isn't toward the beginning. This is the kind of, so one of the things that, that Didion is known for is this kind of, um, this very sort of objective, again, this kind of acuity, but, but, but like a certain scientific kind of um, detached thing, which actually makes sense given the fact that her like ego is dissolving and that she's not making sense of things. She has an ability to report things in a very factual, very journalistic way um, th that I think is unnerving because it is so matter of fact. So, um, and, and it's just shocking here on 13 how, how the scope kind of narrows. Well, listen to this. I watched Robert Kennedy's funeral on a veranda at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel in Honolulu, and also the first reports from Mylai. I reread all of George Orwell on the Royal Hawaiian beach, and I also read in the papers that came one day late from the mainland, the story of Betty Lansdowne Fouquet, a 26-year-old woman with faded blonde hair who put her five-year-old daughter out to die on the center divider of Interstate 5, some miles south of the last Bakerfield, Bakersfield exit. The child, whose fingers had to be pried loose from the cyclone fence when she was rescued 12 hours later by the California Highway Patrol, reported that she had run after the car carrying her mother and stepfather and brother and sister for a long time. I mean, these are the kinds of, so this idea of her fingers on the cyclone fence, I mean, I could spend three hours talking about the details that are chosen here, the idea of a cyclone fence um, as, as a division, the idea of highways, the idea of Bakersfield, um, the, the idea of the stepfather. I mean, they're just, it's absolutely so rich. There's an entire narrative in this kind of one quarter paragraph here. It's just astonishing. And of course, she, you know, she's she's escaped to Hawaii in this case because her marriage is breaking down, which we find all about later. Um, there's a very, very famous sentence that talks about how they rented a, a room at the Royal Hawaiian for a week in lieu of filing for divorce. So so there's this sense of, of these being highly, highly personal times of crisis for her, but about how this crisis, and again, this entropy, this chaos, this lack of order, is, is everywhere around her. Uh, but I would argue that this, this kind of disinterested, like clinical view of facts and this ability to convey them in this way is, is made even more powerful by these select details. The idea of the, of the child's hands having to be, um, you know, pried off of the, of the cyclone fence. Uh, okay, um, I want to talk about women um, as, as the focus. So I, I've discussed a little bit, um, you know, sort of this elevation of domesticity and, and, and Joan Didion is kind of flexing in terms of really being a consummate hostess. And uh, there, it's interesting in, in the section um, later in the collection about women, she really um, takes to task the, the feminist movement. And I think there's kind of a 
ladies, you gotta, you know, get tough and, and stop kind of whining, which is um, not something we're gonna parse today because I simply did not have the time or frankly, the energy. Uh, I also think it, um, that is a reaction. I mean, you know, this is second wave feminism. This is the early seventies. It, it, it's a snapshot that I think is important, but if I were gonna analyze that, I think I would wanna look at it in, in you know, the sort of uh, context of the women's movement not in the context necessarily of, although it fits in this essay collection, certainly, but I would want to discuss it um, in the context of all of her writing about uh, women's liberation and about feminism. Um, but I do want to talk about women as the focus. So on 34 and 35, I think one of the things that she does very well is this, this um, there's a real force to her writing. Again, you know, she's she uh, reported from very difficult parts of the globe. She's a very political reporter. It, she was not afraid to to talk about things that were very difficult and, and sort of like manly kind of things like the Vietnam War or, um, you know, the selling of arms in El Salvador by the U.S. government. I mean, she was very bold in what she would talk about, but there also um, was a real uh, sense of her as a woman and a sense of her um, as as I mean, being a little dismissive of other women, not not specifically, but just as sort of women as a general, um, uh, uh, you know, as a general group, but but also a real sense of um, you know taking to task men who 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 did that sort of thing as well. Um, so we're looking at uh, page thirty four and thirty five. So this is that famous packing list. I I just um, I really I really love it. So to pack and wear again, this is this idea of control. Um, so we're going to skip over to uh, top, the top here. And again, this is uh, in the interest of, of understanding her as someone who is speaking to women. This is a list which was taped inside my closet door in Hollywood during those years when I was reporting more or less steadily. The list enabled me to pack without thinking for any piece I was likely to do. Notice the deliberate anonymity of the costume in a skirt a leotard and stockings, I could pass on either side of the culture. But it is interesting, she's not wearing trousers, she's not wearing, um, you know, a, a pantsuit, she's, she's not even wearing a blazer, you know, this is a, it's a very feminine sort of, you know, she might have a jersey or she might have a cardigan, um, and she has her mohair throw. It, it is, in fact, a very, um, you know, a leotard is, is a very sort of body conscious kind of move, especially paired with a skirt, there's a real sort of femininity. Um, and then down, down a little bit lower, um, she has this idea of, um, of, uh, of sort of bringing this packing list into the context of the piece. It should be clear that this was a list made by someone who prized control, yearned after momentum, someone determined to play her role as if she had the script, heard her cues, knew the narrative. So before, when we read that paragraph where we had all those, um, uh, you know, instances of the word stranger or panel trap, um, here we have this word narrative that comes up again and again and again. So that idea of refrain happens both on the level of the paragraph, but also throughout the entire collection. Um, it, it, it's great when she has those kinds of touchstones and, you know, for your touchstone to be narration or narrative, in a, a collection that's entirely preoccupied with that is so fitting and so helpful for the narrator. But this idea of playing a role too, I think there is this idea that um, she's really sort of copping to the fact that all women feel to a certain degree like they have to you know, play roles and like they are playing a role. Um, let's move on to page 42. This is in that same essay. Um, so this is so interesting because again, this is when we're drilling down a little bit into the Linda Kasabian thing. When I, again, she's, she was the like getaway car driver for the Manson family. When I first met Linda Kasabian in the summer of 1970, she was wearing her hair parted neatly in the middle, no makeup, Elizabeth Arden bluegrass perfume, and the unpressed blue uniform issued to inmates at the Sybil Brand Institute for Women in Los Angeles. She was at Sybil Brand in protective custody waiting out the time until she could testify about the murders of Sharon Tate Polanski, Abigail Folger, Jay Sebring, Wojtoj, sorry, Wojtek Frykowski, and Stephen Parent. So this description of Linda Kasabian is, it's so unexpected because you have this, you know, the parted and the hair. And I actually um, was a little freaked out slash happy because um, 
bluegrass is the deodorant that my grandmother wore and my grandmother and I were very close. She was a, a many generation Californian and um, a, 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 in many ways, I think actually somewhat liked Didion, except that she was very happy and warm. Um, and, and I actually use that same bluegrass deodorant. I have to buy it on eBay. I love it. I love the way it smells. It didn't really make me that happy that it turns out that Linda Kasabian like mass murder a better uh, and I potentially smell somewhat similar. I think Linda Kasabian died. She died um, in her 70s. But um, it, 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 it's interesting to me that level of, uh, again, of femininity. I'm also like, wow, interesting that she's able to wear perfume while she is in jail here, while she's in prison. Um, so it, it, you have, um, the, again, this very sort of um, womanly kind of window into this idea of someone who is, um, you know, a murderer which is, it, it, I guess, the point that I'm trying to make here about women is that it's a very sort of multivalent thing she's doing. Yes, she is speaking directly to women um, who are women readers, people who will understand, you know, what it is to have your hair parted in the middle and what it is to be wearing certain deodorant. They'll know Elizabeth Arden in a way that maybe male readers wouldn't know. Um, but you have this sense of, of, um, of, of attempting to understand someone or maybe maybe she's trying to point out exactly the feeling I had, which was like, yikes, like I have something in common with Linda Kasabian, which might exactly be the point that she is trying to make. Um, if we go right across the page here, um, so, and then uh, she, so the other person who's there with them is Linda Kasabian's lawyer. And she uh, is, Joan Didion here is talking about him. It seemed to confirm some idea he had of women their essential ineducability, their similarity under the skin. Gary Fleischman was cheerful, even jaunty, in the face of the awesome and impenetrable mystery at the center of what he called the case. In fact, we never talked about the case and referred to its central events only as Cielo Drive and La Bianca. We talked instead about Linda's childhood pastimes and disappointments, her high school romances and her concern for her children. This particular juxtaposition of the spoken and unspeakable was eerie and unsettling. So again, I think we can look at this as a kind of fractal and it, it, it's very telling this idea that Didion has, has brought us into this picture of, of uh, Linda Kasabian and later this description of the dresses. I mean, I went and looked and I can show you the images of the dresses and it's very, um, it's eerie and spooky to think that, that that Joan Didion went shopping at iMagnon and bought this cute dress for someone who was about to be convicted of, um, you know, having a large part in the getaway car driving of, of this atrocious murder. There's also that eerie thing where the two of them get together in New York and take their children out to see the Statue of Liberty. Um, and I love that sentence because it ends with the Statue of Liberty and you have this idea of, you know, this woman as a symbol of, of refuge for immigrants and of liberty and, you know, Lady Liberty and you think of Lady Justice, you know, with the scale and the, um, you know, her scale and the, and the blindfold. It, 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 it's this evocation of kind of like these American ideals and yet you're like, why? Why is Joan Didion hanging out? Why why is Linda Kasabian's children like what's happening here in this world? Which is exactly I think what we are supposed to be thinking. Um, okay, and then um, oh we need to look very quickly at the close of this incredible essay uh, on page forty eight. So let's see. Um, okay, so we're gonna take a look at this last paragraph here on page forty eight. Quite often I reflect on the big house in Hollywood, on Midnight Confessions and on Ramon Navarro, and on the fact that Roman Polanski and I are godparents to the same child. But writing has not yet helped me to see what it means. So I think she's ending on this very important note, and in lots of ways she's kind of clarifying the, 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 the importance of this whole entire essay, which is in fact to underscore that she doesn't understand what it means. Um, I, I think that Joan Didion is incredibly good at ambiance and incredibly good at tone, but we also, um, you know, I think she's she's worked some real literary magic there. Again, you know, this notion of, um, of, of making us understand how, you know, certain people who might be on magazine covers or the cover of the LA Times as like a woman of the year might in fact be someone who is having 
a major psychological breakdown or, you know, that marriages that look like the perfect Hollywood, you know, collaborative unit from the outside might be people who are on the verge of divorce or that Linda Kasabian um, might smell great. I mean, that just might be the point that she is trying to make here. Just kidding. It's not the point that she's trying to make. But um, I wish we had more time to talk more, and I'm sure that we will talk more about Didion, both her prose and her, I mean, her, her nonfiction and her fiction. I actually, um, some of her favorite work of mine are, are novels that she has written. One is called A Book of Common Prayer about a woman who is married to an arms dealer in, um, in South America, Central America. Um, an incredible book. We should really read it together if you're interested in um, reading about just really um, insanely great characters and really convoluted plots and, and lots of interesting political intrigue. That's definitely something you should check out. Uh, but thank you for reading. Um, I hope it wasn't too much of a downer, but honestly, like a like a good listen to Pink Floyd or, or, or Sufjan Stevens or your favorite downer music. Sometimes, um, you know, a, 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 a dose of reality and a dose of, of um, you know, pessimism is maybe what we need in this day and age. So thank you so much for joining me. I hope that you got um, a lot out of the lectures and I hope that you head on back to the, the Fox page to uh, listen to yet another lecture uh, on another one of my favorite books. Thanks, happy reading.